All right, everyone, welcome to lesson five of um, our first unit of exponential functions. And for lesson five, we will be looking uh, to discuss something new, something you haven't done before called logarithms. Now, uh, you may have noticed on your calculator that there's this button that says log on it, and you've probably never known what it does. Um, but after today's lesson, and tomorrow's lesson as well, uh, you'll have a good idea of what that button does and we'll be using it often. So our goals for today is obviously to learn about what a logarithm even is. So that's first and foremost. We're gonna learn a little bit of uh, background history on it as well, a little bit later. Um, but we want to be able to rewrite an exponential expression in logarithmic form, rewrite a logarithmic expression in exponential form, Okay, so go back and forth between exponential form and logarithmic form, okay? And then eventually use my calculator to evaluate logarithmic expressions, all right? So that's our goal. In my lesson here, there's a little bit of background, or on my website, there's a little bit of background knowledge that you can go into uh, and read this document about logarithms, okay? Um, but I'm going to go into a little bit myself as well. But before we, we do that, um, I want to present you a problem that we have with logarithms that so far in what we've learned in, in our high school years, we have not been able to solve yet. So in grade 11, you would have learned something about the inverse function, right? So let's say we have an equation, y equals 2x plus 3, okay? So the inverse of y equals 2x plus 3 would solve for x, all right? So let's say we were given y and we needed to solve for x, all right? So how would we rearrange this equation to solve for x? Well, one of the, the ways that we learned last year was that uh, whether you took mixed or functions, you did this. You replaced y with an x, you replaced the x with a y, and then you solved for now what's called your y. All right, this is what we did. We, and then we're just isolating for y. So it becomes, bring the plus 3 over, it becomes x minus 3 equals 2y. And then divide everything by 2 to get rid of the 2 on the right. x minus 3 divided by 2. And there is your inverse function. Okay, so basically you have to just know that the inverse is solving for the other variable. But let's consider an exponential equation, all right? So let's say we have something that says uh, 4 to the power of x is equal to 64. So let's say we have this exponential equation, okay? Or better yet, let's use the letter y. And then later we'll use 64, all right? Just so we have x and y here. Okay, so currently my equation is isolated for y, okay? How would I isolate for x? That is my question and, and a question that we have not yet been able to answer. So if we were to do the inverse of this equation, how can we isolate x? Think about it, it's an exponent, you know? What do you do to this four to bring it to the other side? Do you do the fourth root? No. Do you divide by four, multiply by four? No. There's nothing we can do with this four to bring it over to the other side to get x by itself because x is an exponent. It's not a base. It's an exponent. All right? And so this is the problem we have. And this is the problem that finally in the next couple lessons we'll be able to answer. Okay? Is that's essentially what a logarithm is. It's going to isolate for x. It is the inverse of an exponential function. Okay, so let's get started as uh, we have that introduction there. So the inverse of a function is, it's essentially on a graph, the mirror image, the mirror image of the original function, and I should say here on a graph, okay, it solves for the other variable in an equation, 
okay? So the other variable in an equation, just like I showed you above, okay? So the example is like the example we had above, and I can just write that in here, okay? So if we have y equals 2x plus 3, okay, we can solve for x, okay? By replacing my y with an x, replacing my x with a y, and then solving for y, just like I did above, okay? So I'll just go through this quick. There's your inverse. On a graph, it would look something like this. Let's say this was y equals 2x plus 3. If this was my y-intercept of 3, my line would look something like this, okay? Here's what it would look like on a graph. It would be reflected, the inverse would be reflected across the line y equals x. Across the line y equals x. And so it would essentially look something like this. It's reflected across that imaginary line of y equals x. So this line, this imaginary line is called y equals x. y equals 1x. So a slope of 1 with a y-intercept of 0. Okay, so that's what it looks like. So just to kind of refresh your memory from last year, all right? So to, to find the inverse of an equation from what we knew from last year, you replace the y with an x, the x with a y, and then you solved for your new y. And how that looked on a graph was that you had um, a mirror image. If you were to graph both equations, y equals 2x plus 3, and y equals x minus 3 divided by 2. So that's this equation right here. And this equation right here. You would get this mirror image across the line y equals x. Okay. How does that look for a set of coordinates? So this is an equation. Here's a graph. And now what about for coordinates? Right. What would that look like? What would the inverse coordinates look like? So let's say our function has coordinates um, 1, 2, 3, 5, okay? I'll just keep it at two points. The inverse of that would literally be just flipping your x and y's. So instead of 1, 2, you'd have 2, 1. And instead of 3, 5, you'd have 5 as your x, and 3 is your y. Okay? So that's three things there that we just went over. In an equation, I showed you how to do that. I showed you what an inverse would look like on a graph, and I showed you what the inverse would look like if you had coordinates. All right? But to date, we have not been able to do this middle part here. We have no idea how to find the inverse equation and how to solve for x in an exponential function if x is your exponent, okay? So we have no idea how to do that. So let's scroll down and let's start to, to figure this out. We're gonna start by just looking at a table of values and a graph, okay? So let's create a table of values for y equals two to the power of x. So let's do that and I'll, I'll do that fairly quickly. For the first one, I'll just write two to the negative three we can just use decimals here. I know that this could be two, 1 over two, third, 2 to the power of 3, which is 1 over 8. But as a decimal, 0.125 is good. And I'll keep going here just to fill this in fairly quick. You can just use your calculators if you have to. Okay. Okay. We're now going to take this and we're going to plot this exponential function. We're going to plot our x and y uh, points on this grid here. So do the best you can for the first few where you're ballparking those decimals. So negative 3.125. So I'm plotting, by the way, I'm plotting this coordinate right here. Negative 3 on my x, 0.125 on my y. So it's almost basically essentially touching um, that x-axis there. Then negative 2 and then try to go slightly higher to 0.25. I mean, that's going to be hard to do. And then a little bit higher for negative 1 to 0.5, okay, even if it's not perfectly accurate, do the best you can. 0, 1, 1, 2, 
two, four, three, eight. Okay, and draw your curve. So do the best you can. We have an asymptote at y equals zero. Okay, so it never touches that line of y equals zero right here, my horizontal line of y equals zero, it'll never touch there. Okay, so we've done questions A and B. Let's see what question C is gonna ask of us. What is the domain and range of the exponential function? Okay, simple enough, we've done this before. The domain, what are the x values that are possible for this graph and this equation? Any x value, right? So all you say is that x is an element of all real numbers with no restriction. What about y, or sorry, the range? We'll say that y is still an element of real numbers, so it has to be, a, it can be a, any real number, except that y must be, what, what, what should y be? It can never equal zero or go below zero. So y must be greater than zero, all right? Does the exponential function have any vertical or horizontal asymptotes? Yes, it has a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. Okay, so it never will cross that line of y equals zero. Use the table of values to graph the inverse of y equals two to the power of x on the same axes. So we are now going to graph the inverse. Simple enough, all we have to do is take these coordinates here and flip them. So I'm gonna now plot, okay, 0.125 comma negative three instead of negative 3.125 because it's the inverse, so I just flip my x and y. Now I do 0.25 comma negative two 0.5 comma negative 1, 1, 0, 2, 1, 4, 2, and 8, 3. So let's go on this grid and let's plot all of those. Again, do the best you can to plot those decimals. All right, so now I'm 0.125 on my x-axis and then negative 3 down. So I'm 0.125, negative 3, almost touching the line there, but not. Okay, then 0.25, negative 2. Slightly more. And then 0.5, negative 1. And then it gets easier, 1, 0, 2, 1, 4, 2 and eight, three. Now, where's your new asymptote? We're seeing a reflection here. I told you that the graph of an inverse will reflect across the line y equals x, and that's exactly what we're seeing. If I roughly draw in the line y equals x, you will see that there is a perfect reflection. But look at this. The asymptote is no longer at y equals zero, right? It's no longer here. Where's now my asymptote? It's at x equals zero. It's a vertical line now at x equals zero. So it'll never cross this point here. Okay, do the best you can. It's kind of hard to do, but there you have it. You have the inverse. So simple enough to find the inverse of an ex exponential function if I had to graph it. All I have to do is graph the original function, the, the original exponential, and then swap the coordinates x and y and plot my new swapped coordinates and I will have my inverse function on a graph. But again, we still don't know how to find the inverse as an equation, right? So keep that in mind. Okay, so we've done this. Let's find the domain and range now of my inverse. Okay, so what can my x's now be? My x's can only be greater than zero, right? So it's, it can't be anything less than or equal to zero because of my asymptote. So my domain now is x is an element of real numbers. 
such that x must be greater than 0. And my range is, what can my y values be? Anything. It's going forever in the up and down direction. Okay, so y is an element of real numbers with no additional restrictions. Look at the pattern, everybody. And I'm going to draw on this here, but my domain of my exponential function is now my range of my inverse. And my range of my exponential function is now the same as my domain of my inverse. Okay, and that's true for all inverse domains and ranges. Okay, so keep that in mind. Does the inverse function have any vertical or horizontal asymptotes? Yes, it has a vertical at x equals 0. Okay? All right, so now let's enter uh, the concept of logarithms here. Okay, so let's do a little history of logarithms. And again, there I say, how can we solve for an exponent in 10 to the power of x equals 56? Okay, that's the question that we simply have not been able to answer yet. Okay, so a little bit of background. In the 1400s and 1500s, scientists were being bogged down, okay? This is how logarithms were invented. They're being bog bogged down by long, tedious multiplications, such as the one shown there. John Na uh, Napier was seeking a method to convert multiplication problems into addition problems to make it easier. He discovered and created an extremely creative and intricate table whereby this could be accomplished. So he created what's called these logarithm tables. He called them logarithms. But initially they had a different purpose. The purpose was to make long multiplications easier. And so he came up with this table and he called them logarithms. So for example, suppose you wanted to multiply 2 times 3. Simply look up 2 and 3 on the table and add their corresponding logarithm. Then look up the logarithm of 0.778 on the table and realize that this equals 6. Okay? So, you can see that it lines up with 6 there. So, uh, you know, how did he come up with these logarithms? I mean, I'm not going to get into that. That's a pretty complicated uh, calculation. So he used a complicated method for deriving the numbers in the right column using ratios, and he called them logarithms. This is a simplified version of the table, by the way. If you click on the link there, you can find the, uh, a more uh, detailed version of his table. Okay? So, when did scientists use this? Well, whenever, you know, hundreds of years ago, they were doing multiplications that dealt with astronomy, so very large distances, right? Very large numbers, or very tiny numbers, a lot of decimal places, when it came to the chemistry of atoms. 200 years later, Scientists realized that his table had an even greater practical use. So it just happened to be that his tables actually worked um, with powers of base 10 as well. Okay? So, for example, 10 to the power, so if you look at our table here, 10 to the power of 0.477 equals 3. So, if you looked up 0.477, assume that the base is a 10. So, 10 to the power of 0.477 equals 3. Okay, so he came up with this, and scientists now use the tables to solve, ex to solve exponential equations, but only those with a base of 10. Okay, they kept the word logarithms, although they probably should have changed the word, but just to keep the history behind it, they kept the word logarithms, although the word powers would have made more sense. Okay, so here is how you convert or how you solve for x in uh, an exponential equation, okay? So, say you have a base to the power of x equals a number a. The way that's done to solve for x is you obviously write x equals, okay? You write the word log, okay? And then whatever your base was b, it becomes the small number that goes right here. Okay, so it's a small number, a small number, a, a, a subscript number that goes there. Okay, and then the A is written as a large number here. So the term logarithm can be replaced by power, right? Remember, they kept the word logarithm even though it doesn't make intuitive sense. 
So let's replace that word with the word power. If we were to say this as a sentence, we would say, for example, power b of a equals x. So let's see here. In a sentence, this can be read as what is the power for base b that gives you a? So what is the power is the x part. What is the power? What is the exponent for base b that gives you a? All right, so that's kind of how you say it in a sentence. And if you can remember that, that'll help you convert these easier. So let's do that. Let's convert the following into logarithmic form. So the inverse of these exponential equations, basically solving for x. Okay, so start by saying x equals, right, because we're solving for x. Write the word log. Take your base, right, what's my b here? five. Okay, so write that as a small five there. And what's my a value? It's 125. So say this as a sentence. What power, what is the power for base b, okay, for base b that gives you a? All right. Now it only says to write in logarithmic form. We don't need to solve this or anything like that. So just write it in logarithmic form. x equals log base 4 of 256. Base 2, that gives you 128. Okay, now let's go backwards. All right, we're going to write these in exponential form. So it's important that we're able to go back and forth. Okay, so if it helps, identify what your x, a, and b are. Remember, your x is always going to be by itself on the, on the other side of the equal sign. So x in our case is 6. Oops. a is always going to be that, that big number, in this case 64. And then our base is that little number as a subscript to log, which is 2. So if we were to write this in y equals, or sorry, a equals b to the x, just plug in your numbers, and you have written it in exponential form. So 64 equals 2 to the power of 6. And that's true, right? 2 to the power of 6 does equal 64. So that is our equation in exponential form. Let's do it again. x equals a equals b equals my x is 1 half, my a is 5, and my b is 25. Write it in the form of a equals b to the x. We now know from our last lesson that 25 to the power of a half is the same as the square root of 25, and it would be, in fact, 5. Okay? Next. Okay, so we now have a uh, x equals a equals b equals. My x is 0, my a is 1, my b is 6. Write it in the form of a equals b to the x, and we have 1 equals 6 to the power of 0, and we know that that's true. 6 to the power of anything equals 1. Okay, now we are going to evaluate. Okay, so to evaluate this logarithm, there's two ways that we can do this, and I'm going to show you both ways now. Okay, I'm going to show you both ways because there's a trick to evaluating this, is we can convert it to exponential form and evaluate it that way. Okay, so let's see here how we can convert it to exponential form. Remember that these now, because there's no equal sign, we should put it in, we should say equals x, okay? And let's begin to convert this to exponential form here. Okay, so, we have a base of 6, an a of 36, 
and in our case x equals just x right now okay so we have a base so let's put it in a equals b to the power of x format 36 equals 6 to the power of x so this is one way of solving of solving this but it's uh, it's not the most efficient way there's an easier way to use the log button on your calculator and I'll show you that in a second okay so 6 to the power of something equals 36 well I think it's safe to say we know that it would be 6 squared equals 36 but to do it the long way you would say um, convert 36 to base 6 and say that 6 squared is 36 once you have the same base Okay, let the exponents equal each other, and that's your answer for x. Okay, but that's not the most efficient way. I want to show you a new way to do that. Okay, so I'm going to do that right now. And to do that, I'm going to take you to my website. Right here, this equation, the second one on the right there. Okay, look what that says how to solve using your calculator, because the button on your calculator only works for logs of base 10, okay? It only works for logs of base 10. So, if that's the case, if we just have things, the, if we just have this equation the way it is as it stands, let me pull up our equation, okay? As this stands, what's my base? It's not a 10, is it? My base is a six. So that button on my calculator actually won't work if I just press it, you know, as you would think you would press it just once, um, that actually won't work. Um, you actually need to convert this to be base 10. So if I go back to my website, then we'll be able to use our calculator. So to take any base B, okay, so to take any base, you can convert it to base 10. If you do the log, so you press the log button on your calculator, of whatever your a value is divide it by the log of whatever your base is and that will actually solve it for you it converts it to base 10 so you can use your calculator okay so you'll be able to use your calculator and um, and then solve something like this a lot easier using your calculator so let's do it let's go back and let's erase this okay well, let's write down, we need for that formula, let me write down that formula, by the way, so let's write it, log b of a, okay, so I'll write it right here, just to have it beside us, is equal to the log base 10 over the log base 10 for our base, okay? So if we convert it, right now we're in this format here, right? That's the format we're in. We're going to convert it to this, and then we'll be able to use our calculator. So log base 10 for A. Our A value is 36 divided by the log of 6. Now pull out your calculators. You don't have to do anything with that 10. That 10 is just a communication piece to say that, we're ta that our base is 10. You don't have to do anything with that. Just press log 36 divided by log 6. Okay, so log 36 divided by log 6. Lo and behold, you'll see that you get 2, the same answer that we got before. And now we can do these so quick and easy, right? Let's go quick now. So let's go to find the answer to this. Just do the log of your A value. So log base 10, 729 divided by the log base 10 of 9. In your calculator, do log 729 divided by log 9. Press equals, and you'll get 3. Okay? And then lastly, finish this off. Okay? Do the log of 10,000 divided by the log of 10, and you should get a 4. Okay, so that was really quick and painless as opposed to converting it to exponential form and then solving it that way. We now know how to solve for x in an exponential equation, right? So if I'm going back over this, 
I'll just do it down here. Let's say I have something like this in exponent form. Let's say, so for example, I have um, 6 to the x equals 36, and I have to solve for x. Now, this one's easy enough. I know that it's 6 squared, but let's say it was something a lot more complicated that you couldn't do off the top of your head, right? You would need to know, or you would need to convert this to logarithmic form. Okay, so convert. So, how do you convert it to logarithmic form? x equals log. This is your base. goes right there. This is your a. So, that's b, that's a. And now, look how easy it is. You just go log x equals, convert them to base 10. The log of 36 divided by the log of 6, and you would get x equals 2. So we now know how to solve for x in an exponential equation. Okay? Um, that does it for this lesson. There's a review right here, just a little review of key concepts that is from your textbook. So take a look th through that as well. And um, definitely make sure that you practice this because it's easy to kind of get the form wrong, right? Your X, your A, your B, put them in the wrong spot. You need to practice this over and over again to really get the hang of it. Um, but once you do, I'll tell you, it's very, very easy. Okay, so that concludes this lesson.